Chapter 13, Wages, Hours, and the Wage Motive. We are, as a matter of policy, against hard work. We will not put on the back of a man what we can put on the back of a machine. There is a difference in a man working hard and hard work. A man working hard will produce something, whereas hard work is the least productive sort of labor. It is not possible, except in the crafts which approach the arts, for a man to earn a really good living with his hands. It is management which has so to arrange work that it can be productive of high wages. But the starting point of high wages is the willingness to work. Without that willingness, management is powerless. Somehow a deal of confusion has crept into wages, hours of work, profits, and prices. Most of this confusion traces back to an unwillingness on the part of someone to work. That someone may be a money broker, a manager, or a workman. Or again, all three may be trying to do the impossible, that is, to live without work. Nearly every social theory, when stripped of its emotional trimmings, gets down to a formula for living without work. And the world being what it is, none of these formulas can operate. They can only bring on poverty, for they are not productive. The man who possesses health, strength, and skill is a capitalist. If he can use his health, strength, and skill to the best advantage, he becomes a boss. If he uses himself to still better advantage, he becomes a boss of bosses, that is, the head of an industry. And now take wages. An unemployed man is an out-of-work customer. He cannot buy. An underpaid man is a customer reduced in purchasing power. He cannot buy. Business depression is caused by weakened purchasing power. Purchasing power is weakened by uncertainty or insufficiency of income. The cure of business depression is through purchasing power, and the source of purchasing power is wages. This country could not last any time on the purchasing power of those whose income is independent of what they receive from their work. This country is maintained by work. The evidence of work is wages. The effect of wages is the continuity of work. Reduce wages and you reduce work, because you reduce the demand upon which work depends. Wages is more of a question for business than it is for labor. It is more important to business than it is to labor. Low wages will break business far more quickly than it will labor. The old theory, which still persists in business, is that the rate of wages depends on the bargaining power of the worker as against the monopoly power of the employer. Under that theory, both sides lost. Under that theory, labor unions rose and organized war began, with boycott and lookout as the weapons. Nothing more is needed than these results to prove the theory false. Yet it is clung to by old-line management and old-line labor with equal tenacity. They both are wrong. It needs to be driven home to men's minds that such a theory represents nothing but the accommodation of their logic to their errors. The theory of wages in the past has been merely a description of the predatory spirit that once actuated money-making. There is no standard wage except that set by the energy, ability, and character of all who are engaged in the business. The basic fact is that the standard wage is what management and industry can make it. Upon managers more than on political economists rests the responsibility of furnishing data for the new theory of wages. A business that does not include a steady and profitable wage scale among the good things it produces is not a productive business. A business where the dividends are out of all proportion to the wages is perilously lopsided. Yet a business which should divide every last surplus dollar into wages would be in danger of extinction. There are three factors in the situation. The manager, the employee, and the business. The business as a going concern must always be considered. It provides the worker with an outlet for his activity and the public with commodities and utilities. The right kind of wage increase comes as a result of management having the wage motive. The way to check a threatened depression is to cut the price and increase the wage. High wages with high prices do not help anyone. It just means that everything has been marked up. 
But higher wages and lower prices mean greater buying power, more customers. Cutting wages is no cure for low consumption. It only makes the consumption still lower by reducing the number of possible customers. One of the objects of industry is to create as well as to supply customers. And customers are created by finding out what people want, making it at a reasonable price, and then paying high enough wages in the making so that they can afford to buy. The payment of high wages, however, is not just a matter of wishing to pay them. Neither has the rate of wages much to do with the scale that workmen may ask for. It goes back much farther than that. It goes back to the very structure of the business itself and the ideas on which it is founded. We have heard a great deal about the profit motive being wrong. We have heard nothing at all about what might be called the wage motive. That is the only motive of any importance, for it brings in the whole of service. And when we have real service, the profits have a way of looking after themselves. It is the new modern motive that can control all industry for the public good. The wage question does not start with the workman. It stops with him. It starts back on the drawing board of the employer. And before a pencil is put to paper, the draftsman, the employer, has to know what he wants to do. Is he going to create a thing which will help people, or is he only going to create something to sell to people? There is a vast difference in the approach. If you set out to make something which will help people, then you have to plan slowly and surely, trying out as you go along until you have what you believe is right. Then, and not until then, have you anything worthwhile making. The next step is to find out how to make it, and that is a job which is never finished, for this brings in quality, price, and wages. Your design, speaking of commodities, has to be such that it can be made by machinery. High wages can be paid in the making of luxuries and added into the price. If what has been thought to be a luxury can be manufactured in quantities at a low price, then it may become a commodity and a necessity. That is what has happened with automobiles. If we set ourselves to the payment of wages, then we can find methods of manufacturing which will make high wages the cheapest of wages. And that keeps us always on the drawing board, finding ways and means to improve methods in every direction, in buying, in making, in selling, in transportation, so that prices may be lowered and wages paid. The right price is not what the traffic will bear. The right wage is not the lowest sum a man will work for. The right price is the lowest price an article can steadily be sold for. The right wage is the highest wage the employer can steadily pay. That is where the ingenuity of the employer comes in. He has to create customers, and if he is making a commodity, then his own workers are among his best customers. We have about 200,000 first-class customers in our own company, and the people we directly pay wages to. And we are creating more customers every day in the workmen of the people we buy from. For every dollar we pay in wages, we pay two for materials and parts made on the outside. It is an ever-widening circle of buying. Paying a high wage has the same effect as throwing a stone into a still pond. There can be no true prosperity until the worker, upon an ordinary commodity, can buy what he makes. Your own employees are part of your public. The same ought to be true everywhere. But one of the difficulties in Europe is that the workman is not expected to buy what he makes. A part of Europe's trouble is that so much of its goods has gone abroad in the past that there is little thought of really having a home market. If you cut wages, you just cut the number of your customers. If an employer does not share prosperity with those who make him prosperous, then pretty soon there will be no prosperity to share. That is why we think it is good business always to raise wages and never to lower them. We like to have plenty of customers. But buying labor is just like buying anything else. You have to make sure that you get your money's worth. Every time you let a man give you less than full value for the wage you pay him, you help to lower his wage and to make it harder for him to earn a living. You can do a man no greater injury than to allow him to soldier on his job. The reason ought to be plain. The less work a man does, 
the less purchasing power he creates, which means a lesser number of people to ask for his services. Thus, there can be no standard wage. A wage based on a standard of living is destructive, for it implies that all men are alike and can agree on how they want to live. Fortunately, all men are not alike, and fortunately only a few care to live this year the way they did last year. Any attempt to fix a living wage is an insult to the intelligence of both managers and workers. We do not know what the right wage is, and perhaps we shall never know. But certainly it only clogs progress to try to fix wages without the facts. The world has never approached industry with the wage motive, from the angle of seeing how high wages may be, and until we have had some experience in that line, we shall not know much about wages. Trade union limitations on production can never come up in a well-managed business. They are an answer to bad management. If an employer sells his product at too high a price, with his eye on profits instead of on costs, he will pay low wages, for he will not know what kind of men he needs. He limits his market by his price, and there is no reason why the men who work for him should not also limit their output. Why should men work for an employer who will not so manage his business as to pay proper wages? We have been steadily cutting down the number of men employed per unit of output. If we can arrange the work or the machinery so that one man can do the work formerly done by three, then of course we put the change into effect at once. But that does not mean that two men are thrown out of work. Nobody with us ever thinks about improvements lessening the number of jobs, for we all know that exactly the contrary happens. We know that these improvements will lessen costs and therefore widen markets and make more jobs at higher wages. All of our efforts to reduce the number of men on the single job have resulted in more jobs for more men. There is more to giving service than just the designing of machinery. There is more to management than merely the handling of men. Service is the low-cost production of high-grade goods made by well-paid labor and manufactured and distributed at a profit. No man can really claim to be in business until he has equipped himself to attain these objectives. The theory that efficiency and better methods make for unemployment is pernicious, but it is widespread. It is widespread because so many men make their livings out of preaching it to workmen. It all goes on the theory that there is only so much work in the world to do, and it must be strung out. The professional agitators insist that efficiency makes less work, fewer jobs, and decreases employment. They say that where two men conduct a process that formerly used eight, six men are thus left without work. The fallacy of this has been proved over and over again, and nowhere more effectively than in our own industries. Take England at the present time. Hand in hand with unemployment goes the preaching of the make-work theory. The British bricklayer, with kind intent toward his fellow bricklayer who was out of a job, is easily persuaded that if he will lay only half the number of bricks that he formerly laid, the bosses will have to hire his out-of-work friend to lay the other half. That is, he thinks he is creating two jobs where only one existed before, and so decreasing the evils of unemployment. But he does not make a job. He only increases unemployment by making bricklaying so expensive that few can afford to build houses. Instead of making a job for his friend, he more than likely loses his own job through slackness in the building trade. Though England cries for houses, few houses go up. Working men's houses do not go up at all, the reason being that bricklayers will not lay bricks enough to make an honest day's work, and thus double costs are imposed upon a house, with the result that the working man who should inhabit it with his family cannot afford to. Holding back in any service decreases opportunity. The way for the English bricklayer to make work for all his fellows in the trade is to do so much work in a day that house building will be cheap. And since the country needs cheap housing, bricklayers will be needed. Exactly the same principles apply to management. It is clear what the bricklayer should do. But we have had so much talk about the duties of workmen that we forget to talk about the duties of managers. Really, the slack workman is a product of slack management. The workman did not invent the scheme of getting something for nothing. He only copied those who employed him. 
the manufacturer who gives his workmen as little as he can for their labor, and the public as little as he can for its money, is in like case with the bricklayer, who will handle only half as many bricks as he can. But many a manufacturer sincerely believes that he is paying the highest wages his business will stand. Perhaps he is, but no one knows what he can afford to pay until he tries. In 1915, we raised our wage from an average of $2.40 to a minimum of $5 a day. Then we really started our business, for on that day we first created a lot of customers for our cars, and second, began to find so many ways to save that soon we were able to start our program of price reduction. If you set yourself a task, it is really remarkable how many other things grow out of doing that task. You simply cannot make a thing cheaply and well with cheap men. You have to get good men in order to keep the cost of production down. We have no fixed scale of wages, excepting that no wages must be less than $6 a day, our present minimum, after a man has been broken in. We have that minimum because we set ourselves to paying it, in order to increase our business through making lower costs. We began with a $5 minimum, and later we found that we could add a dollar more. But we have no rule as to what any job is worth. We pay according to the man, and more than 60% of the men earn above the minimum. We have settled on the eight-hour day, not because eight hours is one-third of a day, but because it so happens this is the length of time which we find gives the best service for men day in and day out. Only caretakers work on Sundays anywhere in our industries. Sometimes the rule against Sunday work is violated by superintendents at distant points, but when called to account, we have yet to find one of those superintendents who could justify his Sunday work. As with wages, hours are a matter for management. Another point which we make is that no man can be allowed to consider himself as belonging to a particular craft, and therefore barred from doing work outside his craft. We have an immense fund of men to draw on, and we do draw on them. We have on our payrolls men from nearly every nation on the globe, and from every trade and profession, from accountants and aviators to zoologists and zincographers. We place new employees where they are most needed, not always according to their previous training. We prefer to have men working in their trades rather than out of them, and so we keep a card index record of a man's previous training, if he cares to submit it, and from this source we constantly draw new men. For instance, when the Dearborn flour mills were opened, the original millers came from Highland Park, where they had been working at something else. Experienced greenskeepers for the Dearborn golf course also came from the shop. Once a man skilled in bar relief work was needed, and the card index turned up a talented sculptor who was working on a drill press. We do not believe in paternalism. When first we raised the wages to $5 a day, we had to exercise some supervision over the living of the men because so many of them, being foreign-born, did not raise their standards of living in accord with their higher incomes. That we entirely gave up when the need had passed. We feel that a man ought to have savings enough to tide him over any crisis, but there are times when illness wipes out the savings, and then we arrange for loans. We have legal and real estate departments and stand ready, in fact, to render any reasonable service that is asked for. We had to branch into storekeeping at Highland Park in 1919 because rents and prices were everywhere being forced up on our men, and it seemed useless to pay good wages if the men could not get value for them. At first we went in only for groceries and drugs, but now we have butcher, clothing, and shoe shops, and also sell fuel. We have ten stores in all, and they do a business of ten million a year, at prices on an average of 25% below the market. The stores are restricted to our employees and executives, and are on the cash-and-carry basis. We sell only first-class products, and some of them come from our own lands. A deal of the bread is made from flour raised on our land and ground in our mills. The coal, coke, and briquettes are all from our own properties. Arranging to have the employees share in the profits of a business up to a degree presents many difficulties. We have devised a plan of investment certificates, which seems to work out. These certificates are issued in denominations of $100 and are non-negotiable and non-assignable. 
They are paid for by the employees on the installment plan and have a guaranteed return of 6%, but additional payments may be made at the discretion of the Board of Directors. We have voted returns as high as 14%. The men's investments have reached as high as $22 million. These are only details, things over and above wages. No service to employees will take the place of wages. The wage motive requires that the highest wages be paid, for not otherwise will the cycle of purchasing power be started. Of necessity, the work of an individual workman must be repetitive. Not otherwise can he gain the effortless speed which makes low prices and earns high wages. Some of our tasks are exceedingly monotonous, as was outlined in my life and work. But then also, many minds are very monotonous. Many men want to earn a living without thinking, and for these men, a task which demands no brains is a boon. We have jobs in plenty which need brains. We are always looking for brains, and men with brains do not long stay in repetitive work. After many years of experience in our factories, we have failed to discover that repetitive work injures the workman. In fact, it seems to produce better physical and mental health than non-repetitive work. If the men did not like the work, they would leave. In 1913, in the Highland Park plant, we had an average monthly turnover of 31.9%. In 1915, we introduced the $5 a day minimum, and the turnover dropped to 1.4%. In 1919, when labor was floating everywhere, the rate rose to 5.2%, and now it is at 2%. Out of 60,000 men at the River Rouge plant, only about 80 men are in and out each day. Our turnover now is mostly due to illness or discharge for wanton and repeated disobedience. Fully to carry out the wage motive, society must be relieved of non-producers. Big business, well-organized, cannot serve without repetitive work, and that sort of work, instead of being a menace to society, permits the coming into production of the aged, the blind, and the halt. It takes away the terrors of old age and illness, and it makes new and better places for those whose mentality lifts them above repetitive work. We need more creators than ever we did, not fewer. And that the system is universal, we have proved by our plants and branches scattered over nearly every part of the earth, as will be shown in a later chapter. <laughs>